All right, well, thank you everyone for joining in. Appreciate your time. We are just a few minutes off, um, but we are starting with our first session. And uh, as part of that, here are the agenda that we're looking at. We got uh, you know, a keynote address coming from Aditya uh, at 3.35. We will have that for about 10 minutes. And uh, after that, we'll move to the webinar at 3.45. We'll take about two questions at the end of that. And once that is done, uh, the second half will be our panel conversation, which will take at 4.15. The idea is to run about 20, 25 minutes, and then we'll leave some more time at the end for question and answers. With that, I will now hand it over to Aditya. Aditya is ex Accenture. He is the digital transformation leader and an emerging technologies expert. Aditya, with that, over to you. I will manage your presentation. Okay, thank you, Vikas. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I am Aditya Devaskar, and the topic I'm going to basically cover is the key trends and challenges in the financial world. Um, I'd like to thank Botminds.ai and Impact Media, who've given me this opportunity to, you know, talk on this topic. So, uh, Vikas, if you move on to the next one, right? So, <laughs> so in this current day and era. There's there's a huge shift uh, in the in the in the financial world in that sense, right? I mean, uh, products have actually become kind of commodity, right? I mean, the four P's which we had learned, uh, you know, in the MBA days, you know, they are not there anymore, right? I mean, they have become commodities. If you look look at the banking products, you look at the insurance products, you pretty much find, you know, th there's no differentiation per se in that. I mean, uh, you know, the, the pricing is the same, the product lineup is the same, the way, you know, they're, they're selling to the customers is pretty much the same. The only biggest differenti differentiating factor in today's day and era is the customer experience. And when I say customer experience, it's customer experience and the digital experience. So that's become the key differentiating factor for, you know, to sell anything uh, in, in this day and era. And if you look at some statistics, right, I mean, 50% of the workforce in 2020 were the millennials, right? Millionaires are guys who've been born with the phone in their hand, literally, right? And in this, and this number is going to be 75% in 2025. It's, it's a huge shift in terms of the demographics in that sense, right? I mean, and the banks, the financial institutions really, really need to focus on these things. And they need to focus on the customer experience and digital experience uh, and if they don't do that, they're going to be left behind, way, way behind, right? The second big thing which is coming out is that this is the era of mass personalization. You know, I spoke about, uh, you know, four Ps, you know, uh, I, and during that time, we used to be taught about target market segment. So this, there is the segment where, you know, uh, you know, they have a behavioral pattern, they have a spending pattern, they have a purchasing power. So those were the segments we talk about during that time. There was probably three, four years, five years back. And that's completely changed. It's all about that individual person, okay? Especially with, with the millennials, Gen Y, Gen Z, uh, it's all about data. You know, you, you pick up your phone, you, you know, you go through internet, you go through any app, you are leaving a trail of data. And what companies are basically doing is, you know, they're using, you know, data science, data analytics, big data, to chunk up all this information which you're you know you're you're leaving behind with a layer of ai ml and what they're doing is personalizing that to you they are saying that risk appetite of aditya devaskar is at this level purchasing power of aditya devaskar is this level he's going to make a decision of purchasing an uh, uh, insurance product within this particular time and his his risk appetite for that particular product is you know uh, is this much and, and with that data, you can you know, go out to customers, personalize it to their particular need uh, with the data they're giving us. And, and that's going to be the name of the game. And, and uh, today's, you know, if you look at you know, today's generation, okay, they don't have time to you know, uh, you know, sit and do anything. They just want everything on the fingertips. And they're spoiled for choices, right? I mean, if you look at one segment of insurance, there'll be thousand products, right? And you need to make um, make your uh, uh, distinct yourself or differentiate yourself within that kind of space at this moment. So you know, it's very important that you have amazing customer experience. Um, you know, invest in data uh, for mass personalization, and 
you know focus on you know the the kind of demographics you are basically you know you basically tackling so if you move on to the next one because the other paradigm shift is is i see are is going to be fintechs right i mean um, so if you if, if there's a slide you know and it's a little dated in that sense and there's a purpose which i've you know i've kept it there there's some numbers on it okay so this graph is from 2018 and what it basically says is that the global fintechs um, uh, fintech market is going to be about 45 billion us dollars in 2020 any guesses on that number it is it is triple that number right now it is 125 billion dollars it's it's grown substantially you know they had made some prediction it's it's surpassed that prediction they're saying 2025 it's going to be about about uh, close to about 360 370 billion dollars and and the number could be way more and how the fintechs really really made the difference right i mean they have they have taken a segment and they have really changed the whole customer experience around it right i mean uh, so i'll give you an example right i opened my zero dhar trading account two months back couple of months back right it took me exactly 10 minutes to open the account i had the aadhar ready with me with the aadhar ot uh, ot verification with my kyc and everything it just took me 10 minutes and i go back to my experience when i opened my hdfc dmat account and my trading account it took me exactly 3 days i remember you know carrying my aadhar pan card taking xerox copies of it filling up forms after forms signing in on so so what the point i'm trying to drive is that you know there's a complete shift in terms of the customer experience you know what what we what we see from you know these fintechs you, you know you know you look at zero dha you look at paytm you look at phone pay the ease of making payments is phenomenal and if if the banks the financial institutions don't catch up with that kind of experience it's 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 going to be game over kind of a thing right and the other thing which fintechs are doing very very well is they are targeting the uh, uh, the segments you know which are profitable in nature so banks and financial institutions biggest profits they make are from payments are from the insurance products are from the trading products and stuff like that and and fintechs are specializing so they are laser focused on that segment they give a supreme product they have a supreme customer experience and that and and they, they capture the market right and if they keep going at it like that this the i mean the banks margins the banks profitability is going to take a severe hit so banks need to realize this immediately they need to come up they need to significantly change the business model how they are uh, you know doing the current businesses especially in, in these segments of payments insurance and others where fintechs are targeted uh, targeting them and completely change the business model towards the customer and customer experience right and if they're not able to do that they need to you know buy these fintechs or merge with them you know through apis or whatever but that's something which is going to be a big big game changer for banks and for the financial institutions because if you want to move on to the next one thank you so cloud right cloud is a no brainer right i mean everybody wants to get into cloud everyone everybody uh, you know wants to do cloud and it's the right thing to do right i mean if it saves money and stuff for like that but from a from a you know banks from a financial institution there's uh, there's another you know um, another paradigm to it right i mean banks are really scared they're scared about that data you know uh, if there's going to be a data breach in this they they're scared about the regulatory and compliance as the government's put put around you know these banks and stuff like that and you know the legacy it system and let me give you so if there is a data breach you know within the banks that could cost banks billions and billions of dollars we have seen you know some of the western banks have actually paid you know millions or billions of dollars right they because they had, they they had uh, you know regulatory breach or compliance breach you have examples of hsbc you have examples of um uh, you know bank of america we had to pay billions of dollars uh, you know because of money laundering and regulatory breaches and stuff like that right and and there's some number around it so for every breach data breach it costs the bank about 145 dollars to 154 dollars for a compromise account if their account runs into hundreds of thousands you can imagine the impact on the bank so banks are kind of scared from that standpoint you know a, a breach of data regulatory compliance and regulatory compliance the government is becoming stronger and st stronger with the regulatory needs and the compliance needs and the legacy it system right but cloud is the way to go right i mean if you if you want to make make a, a unified platform you want to have a unified strategy to go to the market to to target the market so the cloud is the way to 
move ahead, right? And I'll, I'll give you one more statistic, right? So when uh, in 2020, they did this analysis of, you know, some major banks and, you know, financial institutions, what they basically figured out is about 65 to 70 or almost 75% of the IT spend goes to run the bank, right? And there's hardly left to change the bank. And if the bank start looking at cloud seriously, okay, because of the benefit it gets from, you know, moving from a CapEx model to OPEX model, you, you, you will save money from that standpoint and you will be able to invest uh, that savings into change the bank. So it's, it's very important for banks and financial to look, that, look at it seriously because that's going to give them a huge cost saving. Uh, okay. And the other thing it's going to give them is it's, it's going to give them, uh, you know, time to do other things rather than maintaining the servers and, you know, expensive things and stuff like that. And the other thing is, you know, you pay of what you use. It's scalable, right? I mean, if, you, if you're using X amount of um, X amount of cloud space, you pay for that. And if, if, you, if you're actually scaling down, you pay less for that. So those are very, very important. The other thing which I'm coming, you know, in terms of, you know, control of data, regulatory and compliance, right? Cloud brings variety of functions, right? It, it, there is hybrid, there's multi-cloud. So hybrid is basically, I'm saying that, you know, uh, there is data, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is, this is, this is private data. It can't go out anywhere. There could be a high breach possibility of this data. I put that data into a private cloud, right? I mean, I control the bank controls that in the cloud, but which is private to, to the bank or the financial institutions, but rest of the st stuff can be on public, right? You have a multi-cloud strategy. You can say that, you know, I want an enterprise, my enterprise software can be on AWS, but I want to do my, my containerized microservices on, uh, you know, the, uh, the Google, you know, the container platform run on Kubernetes, right? So that, those are some of the things which we can do. I mean, and bank have got all these options in front of them. And cloud and this day and era brings so many other functions, right? I mean, you have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service. You can use any of these. I think the most important right now, and, and a Google platform, a Google Cloud platform has brought this, is the data and the power of data analytics, right? The banks and the financial institutions don't have to invest significant amount of money on these, you know, data science, data analytics, or big data programs, because all that is being provided on cloud right now. And they can use cloud to go through zillions of data, structured, unstructured data, to, you know, make right decisions, you know, for this. You have, you know, uh, Vision AI, which can help you with your AI things. You have TensorFlow, which helps you with NLP. So there is there is a world of things, you know, uh, in a, uh, the benefits which, you know, cloud gets. And then you know all these issues around cloud, uh, the control of data, regulatory compliance, legacy IT system, and stuff like that can be actually controlled when you move you know quickly into cloud. So if you move on, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'll try and to I'll try and cover as much as possible. Cybersecurity again, absolutely no brainer. As and when we you know come on to new technologies, this is going to be, become really really critical, right? I mean we talked about data breaches, privacy, regulation, stuff like that. So this becomes more and more important. I'll give you a quick example, right? Uh, we are coming into the uh, era of 5G, right? I mean, 5G is, is making space. And they're saying that, you know, once 5G comes in, the machines are going to talk to each other, right? I mean, uh, machines enabled with uh, IoT devices will start talking to each other and there'll be no human intervention, right? I mean, that's going to open an era of, of different computing altogether. When machines start talking to each other, is going to be a different ball game and 5G is going to help with, with, with that. And, and that will bring in this huge issue about cybersecurity, right? I mean, if a hacker wants to do some malicious activity, he gets a malicious IoT device and gets into your database and he tries to get as much data as possible you know, out of it or breach your data and stuff like that. So, the, you know, when, when machines start talking to each other, IoT takes a significant you know, uptick when 5G comes into picture. It's going to be a different ball game, right? And then banks and financial institutions really, really need to be on top of the game in terms of cyber security. And uh, if you move on to the next one, blockchain. Uh, this is my favorite topic, right? Uh, and uh, talking about security, I think this technology at this at this stage, this technology is what internet was, you know, probably 25, 25 years ago, right? I mean, that time, you know, internet was there to just check your mail and stuff like that. Now you cannot do anything without the internet. And I'm telling you the financial institutions in the next two to five years would not be able to work without blockchain. And I'll give you some examples and I'll, I'll talk about 
the core concepts of blockchain, right? Immutability of data. The way the data is stored in currently in, in the in the blockchain with the uh, with the hashing function, you know, it, it's it's immutable, right? Once the block is formed, you use tremendous amount of power. I'm just talking about blockchain. I'm not talking about hyperledger and stuff like that. But I'm just talking about the concept of blockchain. Uh, once you once you you know once you put the data in a block, right? I mean, you use your cryptographic hash function stuff like that. It's immutable. It's it's next to impossible to you know break that. The other big thing which has come through blockchain technology is the peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem, right? I mean, you have nodes, which are basically your computers. They actually monitor the entire ecosystem. And what they do is they ensure that no malicious activity is happening in the ecosystem. That is number one. And the number two part is that there is the, the, uh, uh, the, cent the, the control of the central authority Okay, over the over the ecosystems, over you know, over um, over the financial world, goes away significantly or just disappears completely, right? And then you don't have to pay the uh, pay a fee or rent to that central authority. I'll give you an example. Okay, Ripple is uh, is a company which is on based on DLT, which is distributor distributed ledger technology based on blockchain, and they do cross border payments and cross border transfer of money. Swift is the biggest, you know, uh, biggest currently the biggest financial institution which does the cross-border payments or transfer of money and stuff like that. And they charge, they take anywhere between two to three days to do the transfer. And they and any of these companies charge anywhere between five to ten percent uh, transaction fee on the overall thing. Ripple does that transaction across cross-border payments across countries and stuff like that in less than three seconds, and they charge 0 0.001, just a fraction of that charge. Why would you not move into this ecosystem, okay? When you have, you know, so many benefits, and there, there are so many use cases which are coming out. You know, there are use cases which are coming out. KYC AML banks actually spend almost ten to fifteen percent doing KYC AML on customers. They're coming on different different products, and blockchain can just make that in a fraction of a cost. If they start putting the system. So, so you know, this is going to catch up very very soon. And the other big thing which is happening in blockchain is smart contracts. I mean, smart contracts is a code which is written, and between parties. And once the parties suffice, you know, what they have uh, agreed to in the smart contract, the you know the transaction goes through. Right? It's going to make a huge huge impact in the investment world. Right? I mean, you'll see smart contracts not in the investment world. They also um, they also smart contracts between IoT devices, which there are some use cases from that. And blockchain systems are way cheaper than the current systems, right? And so you know, I think uh, financial institutions and banking they're actually sitting on the side, and 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 looking at this technology, but they need to invest today because this is going to make a huge difference. Because if you move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time. You have just one minute if you could just. Okay, stop. let me just let me just quickly uh, do this. So yeah, I'm not going to belabor on this, and because I know you're going to you know talk a bit about this, but AI has really come to a level. Uh, you know, you look at. So I was working with this uh, company, and we were deploying chatbots. Seventy-two percent, uh, seventy to eighty percent of the chats or the voice calls we were able to handle within the chats, chatbots, and the voice bots. So you know that's the kind of cost savings we can do with these AI and robotics. And gone were the days, you know, where we used to look at you know macros and stuff like that, basic kind of thing. Now we do you know hyper automation, so end-to-end -end automation, right? But there are some challenges. There, are, you know. You, know, you can't do 100% uh, automation, right? So, uh, and it's a con continuous learning kind of a thing. This, that's very, very important. It's very important to process standardization. So when I was working with this company, you know, they had different processes in Europe, in Asia. And what we basically told them is that, you know, first you standardize your product. And that's where you see the bang for the buck when you automate it across regions. So that's what you want to so process standardization first and then automation. And the last point is that, you know, you need to actually, uh, so how you operate pre-automation, how you operate post-automation is very, very important. What is your target operating model after you do your automation is what you need to really think of, right? I mean, that's going to give you the bang for the buck. That's going to give you the real value from an automation standpoint. Thank you, Vikas. Thanks, Aditya. All right, Sami. Thanks, Aditya. Over to you, Vikas, uh, for your session on uh, uh, intelligent process automation for uh, financial services back office. Thank you. All right, um, continuing with this. Um, so thanks, uh, Aditya, for your point of view. Um, it is good to 
to at least get a different side where we're looking at the entire entire value chain in terms of the various technologies that are coming together to essentially bring about the real change when it comes down to financial services and you know finance overall uh, and i think it's a complete technology landscape that is changing there um, you know the key pieces that you mentioned are in terms of cloud in terms of you know the uh, the the point that everybody's almost on the cloud you've got the 5g you got the blockchain i think blockchain is definitely you know here to stay there is there's no question about that and lastly in terms of the automation so my effort here today is to bring about the fact that what are the things that we can do when it comes down to uh, automating document uh, processes uh, document related processes and of course it's goes without saying that the the back office essentially is already gone through a large transformation change uh, through all the rpa processes which have been there so far and with that that things those things changed and brought in the the benefit of uh, the overall automation uh, to the back office organization whether financial services or non financial services the next frontier of course is where rpa headed towards was handling uh, non standard inputs to getting you know to be able to bring things inside uh, for processing and that's where the key piece of the i i like to call it as a final frontier when it comes down to automation uh to a large extent of course that's how that's the visibility that we have so far and uh, as part of that is there are a lot of pieces there are a lot of processes which are there in the financial services you know which kind of need which are very heavily dependent upon smes which are very heavily dependent upon people uh and the reason for that is because they all deal with unstructured data they all deal with data that is coming in it's non standard example of that really are various types of researches you've got covenant research equity market research credit research you've got valuation company comparable analysis you've got risk compliance which is underwriting data analytics you've got company profile and actions and advisory which is investment advisory and m&a advisory now all of these pieces there's a large piece of our uh you know organization which is back offices uh, you know gic's gcc of a various you know uh, levels essentially are dealing with all of this data and this is what we are specifically talking about here uh you know there is sometimes a confusion between fna and and the financial services of course those are important things but we are basically focused on these areas on the financial services in our conversation today so when you look at all these financial services processes the variety of documents that come in are things like regulatory filing annual reports analyst reports news articles call transcripts and what is really common across all of this is one they are they are unstructured documents they don't come into any standard template or a format uh they don't come in as regular uh you know input that says here is the field information here is the value it essentially is a call transcript it's a conversation that we are having now it gets you know recorded gets transcribed and it's a completely open conversation now the challenge with that really is that rpa cannot process unstructured data that's that's basically the challenge there and of course rpa kind of understood 2 3 years ago and that's where the development towards cpa ipa uh, you know hyper automation all those things various names which are there started you know from that point but ipa of course is is a general term for multiple things you know you got rpa plus ai is roughly translated you know ipa but to be able to handle these documents as an input and still be able to generate the output it needs significant amount of you know ai modeling significant amount of variety of tools and structures to be able to get the extraction out out of any type of these you know formats various companies various countries uh various types of you know information to be able to pull that out now with that there comes multiple challenges when you're looking at being these things being done manually so the challenges that you're looking at is you got documents like i mentioned that come in from variety of types they come in from variety of sources they can kind of need to be clean even before certain human being certain sme start up with that process can need to be clean there uh then most of these things are completely dependent upon uh people and knowledge so it needs to be read it needs to be understood basically you need human grade intelligence there uh and all of that currently lies with the smes when it comes down to workflow you need an end to end workflow so that all of the processes from extraction to delivery is basically addressed measurement and timeline this is usually the challenge when it faces in terms of a non standard processes input or non standard 
terms and conditions, which even SMEs have not been trained for, and they either miss out or they, or they you know, pick up the wrong information. So it goes through a QC, QA check for accuracy. And then the biggest piece that comes really is the seasonality and dependence of you know, IT if you're looking at an IT-based solution. And that is a challenge when you see, uh, you know, build or buy versus, you know, pick up something that you can mash together as three or four components versus, you know, something that just works, you know, together. So the IT dependency is usually uh, a delay when it comes down to business's speed of execution. So when you look at that, we have look at we look at it from a perspective of you know AI first platform. So we look at the fact that if somebody has to solve this document based processes, it needs to be an AI platform that can read and understand documents just the way human beings do. Uh, it should be able to capture the knowledge of the SMEs and retain that knowledge within the platform rather than uh, just have certain processes and still the SMEs are sitting around the automation, you know, helping the automation along the way. And last piece is that it should be able to integrate with a variety of important critical systems all the way through at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. Now, with all this construct, uh, we look at it from a, from a point of view that speed and intelligence is critical to automation. What currently exists with an RPA is speed, so that's a bot speed. But what is missing in the overall automation is the intelligence that comes from the SME. So a bot speed and mind's intelligence is essentially a combination uh, that you're looking at to be able to have a complete automation, specifically when it comes down to document processes, uh, you know, based workflows. Now, when our approach is fairly simple, we look at AI first. Uh, uh, we are a no-code automation. We have ready-made modular blocks that you can just stack up on the basis of your requirements on the basis of your processes. There are pre-trained models which are kind of available. And then we offer end-to-end -end, uh, automation as part of the platform. And as a result of all that, uh, the dependency on IT, apart from that initial setup kind of changes, and it comes down to business because you don't really need to write any code. And the fact that most of these training and the models, uh, AI models are pre-trained, you're basically looking at getting efficiency and results and accuracy within weeks rather than you know, months and years. So what we have to offer as part of a unified platform, we have kind of fused the IDP components, which is our core uh, capability, and our build around with that. If you read from left to right, top to bottom, you're looking at connectors, AI supervision, and the legend here is the blue ones are the IPA components and the yellow ones are the IDP components. So we're looking at, you know, ingestion and loading and it comes down the second piece where we are looking at which model needs to load data across multiple pieces. Then you've got a variety of other pieces, which is, you know, uh, all the document AI, semantic AI, table AI. So if you're looking at unstructured call transcript analysis, something that we look at today as part of the case study, you're basically looking at semantic analysis and document understanding. If you're looking at annual reports, you're basically looking at a combination of all of these. And these things come in variety of, you know, uh, variety of types of documents. You've got PDF, you've got form, uh, data may just be sitting at a web page. It doesn't really matter. All of these pieces get extracted and an end workflow from an extraction to uh, delivery. So from uh, ingestion to extraction is basically completed with a single unified platform. All right, so let's quickly jump on to uh, you know, a couple of case studies. I've got two examples here because I think show and tell is a bit, bit more valuable for you know, all of you here rather than just looking at you know, what I've got on our fancy presentations here. So on the first example uh, really is uh, call transcript analysis. Um, the call transcript is a 60 minute long, very critical piece of uh, you know, information that is transcribed uh, as part of the, you know, the earnings call uh, that an organization has. And of course, it has a variety of information. It's got information about investments, it's got results, it's got key participants, key stakeholders, you know, any partnership, et cetera, et cetera. All that pieces of information is, is part of the call transcript. And uh, the challenge that we had here when we were working with this organization is that, you know, you got, you got all this call transcripts which are available. The current the current transcription analysis systems 
essentially can only do semantic analysis, right? They can just find, say, here is the, um, you know, here is the red, here is the green, here is the thing that you should be concerned about, here is, you know, the, the kind of okay, and they just leave it at that. You've got a document which is basically color coded. You, of course, have information about who joined uh, and who participated, but usually that's where it kind of ends. Uh, our client specifically was looking at uh, extracting more information than just that uh, based on their taxonomy. A taxonomy is fields, attributes, whatever you would want to call the information kind of needs to be extracted there. And at the same time, they wanted this to be done kind of in real time basis because otherwise people were anyway sitting down and doing that manually. So what we were able to do for our client is define a one time setup, you know, custom taxonomy for the transcript to understand what is the information that kind of needs to be extracted. And then we pushed that and did the training uh, to our model, which already has a table understanding, semantic understanding document, all the pieces that you saw in the previous slide. It already has that. And what we did was we took 100 transcripts, we did the, you know, the training of our AI model, and then the going from that point onwards, we were able to generate uh, you know, transcriptions, uh, extraction from the transcriptions, kind of in the real time basis. You know, the moment the transcript is available, you open that up and the information is extracted just in a couple of minutes time. So that's the results that we were able to deliver. Uh, Multi-page call transcription done in a couple of minutes, uh, seasonality, not a problem. And when there was, you know, nothing much to handle, we also, you know, went into the archive and we kind of, uh, you know, enriched the database uh, from, from, uh, from the documents there. So I'm going to switch my screen here uh, and I'll come back and ask Gokul if he can still see it uh, because I'll be going on to a demo mode now. Gokul, can you see my screen? All right, can anybody confirm if you can see my screen? Okay, fantastic, thank you. Okay, thanks. So we got a couple of transcripts which are kind of loaded. This is our platform. Uh, what you see is uh, on the left-hand side, the document gets loaded. On the right-hand side, the value is kind of already extracted. So it's basically done in real time. This is a Walgreens transcription, <coughs> excuse me. So if you look at it, it's a 22 page, uh, very standard, standard in a way, completely unstructured. The information is, you know, wherever this information needs to be. And these are the pieces of information that we kind of needed to be, needed to pull out from this document. We're looking at company name, uh, you know, for merger, we're looking at change in quarter, apart from just standard information of just the records and the name. And the way this platform uh, platform essentially works is, you know, you got the value here, but the moment you click on it, it tells you where the value is extracted from, uh, pretty standard in that way. Uh, but it's not just that, it extracts the name of the company as well, and it breaks everything down into multiple records, right? So you got all the pieces of information neatly extracted. And so it may look very simple at the moment, but we look at uh, other pieces of information, or this is fine, we have participants, we have extracted that. But there is a cash flow information somewhere in this transcript, which was mentioned that the cash flow increased by 13%. So our AI is kind of picked up where in this document there, there's a mention about that cash flow, if at all. If there wasn't any, there wouldn't be any information on the right hand side. And what essentially was the amount. So that reference was kind of picked up. And given the fact that this is the Walgreens, so there's a lot of confirmation, uh, conversation about COVID related. Uh, you know, uh, conversation that is going on. So we kind of picked that up and extracted the whole bunch uh, of information that was there related to COVID and its impacts here. And this thing continues on. You're looking at the impact amount. You're looking at not just that, you're looking at a positive impact and a negative impact. So a determination whether a particular conversation that happened during the transcript is a positive impact or it's kind of a negative impact for anybody who's kind of reviewing this. And at any given point of time, whether there's a reference to a change in operations, all those small specific pieces which usually could go unnoticed or need human grade understanding to be able to read this 22 page document and extract those values you know, can be done right here. And it's not just that you have the ability to take this information out uh, you can take this out into a PDF format, into a JSON, CSV, TSV, et cetera. Or you could just have a downstream API connectivity done from botminds and all of that, you know, pushes through. I'll show that to you in just, uh, just another minute. 
Well, I'll come back. I've got one more case study that I want to actually um, share with all. So I'm going to switch my screens again. So let's see that, that. Okay, so I guess that's um, available there. All right. So that's a that's a second case study. So what we're looking at in this one is we've got annual reports that are kind of um, where the information needed to be extracted. And that's a lot of financial services organizations, um, you know, kind of do that. Um, and it takes a very long time. It takes, uh, you know, them up to six to eight hours to probably a day to look through annual reports. Um, annual reports change on the basis of the type of industry, if it's, uh, you know, travel sector, airline sector versus finance versus retail, the contents of the annual reports essentially would change. Um, so in this case, the client had roughly to process about 50,000 annual reports on a quarterly basis, multiple regulatory standards, multiple types of languages, not, not the language, but multiple types of ways in which those uh, standards were written. Um, and of course, you had non-standard tables as well where the information needed to be. And this is a very typical, interesting example where you've got uh, the way you got free hand doc, free flow documents with tables, with detailed tables, and with tables that kind of look like tables, but human beings can obviously pick that up. And some of the information essentially sits as part of the notes and uh, description as well. Um, same thing, we built a you know client taxonomy. We had our pre-trained model deployed there, and within the four weeks' time, we were kind of able to bring in a reduction of about you know 75% of time. So we were able to bring in from an eight hour effort down to two hours uh, with human in the loop. Of course, the results from our side were kind of real time. And once we had done the first industry, we kind of took that experience and brought it to a second you know, industry as well. And I will show you a demo of that uh, now. So I'm gonna switch my screens again. Going back here. All right, so let's look at this example. This is an annual report. Um, you know, that we've kind of loaded up. Uh, this is an organization called Tech 2019 Annual Report. It's a 142 page document. And specifically for this demo, we kind of configured about four or five different values that needed to be picked up. So we're looking at net income, same way. Uh, it goes to the specific place to extract the value. Now this is where it becomes tricky and, and table understanding is literally one of the biggest challenges that AI and AI organizations are currently facing, uh, you know, AI. Uh, platforms are currently trying to solve, you know, whether it's Google, Amazon, or all the way other to the other spectrum here. Um, to be able to understand, you know, the, the column uh, 2019 is written where, and where is the value of profit and loss. And this is, you would see that it's written as net income. So we're not doing a find net income and show the value. It's literally a semantic level understanding of what that value is. You got net sales, which is revenue. You got current assets. And this is an interesting one. Uh, the current assets are not, it's not picked up that, hey, there's no value written against current assets. Our AI has determined that the current asset essentially is a summation of all of these pieces. And this 4,495 is actually the correct value. Uh, same goes with the current liability as well. Let me take another example here, uh, a different uh, annual report completely. Um, this is another organization, Magna International. We're looking at the same thing, net income, et cetera. I will quickly bring to the other piece, which is the employee headcount. And as you would see that this literally is sitting somewhere else, you know, page number three, uh, somewhere it has been mentioned in our AI basically has extracted that, okay, 165,000 essentially is the, uh, is the actual headcount for the employees. Now from here, you could extract the value. I'm gonna do a table extraction as an example, and I'm gonna update my share so you can see everything without a challenge. I will open up this table. And this is a very standardized output that uh, you know, we've kind of configured. So the standard, art, standard output comes out. And you're looking at, do I just extract employees here? Okay, that's funny. So you're essentially looking at all the values that should come out uh, right over here. So let me just try that one more time. Go back, extract. Tabular format. All right, so we just, for some reason, decided to extract only specific pieces, but essentially what you're looking at is that all of the pieces which are written here in terms of the value attribute on the right-hand well, side, get extracted. 
And there are a couple of questions that you know usually asked in terms of the data privacy. So we are a SaaS-based platform. Uh, this platform essentially sits on the cloud, um, and our AI gets deployed in that private cloud. So data essentially never leaves. Uh, so the, from from that private cloud. So essentially, looking at all the data that you upload, never really there's no need for it to come down to bot mines because the AI is essentially sitting with you in your in in the cloud instance. And all the other pieces that you see here in our integration audit logs, steam management, role-based, I can specify and say, okay, extraction is done before it gets, uh, uh, before it goes ahead and touches my other system, I want, uh, you know, a workflow to be added. I want somebody to do a first analysis and then I want somebody to do an approval and all of those pieces you can absolutely build in as part of the, as part of the overall workflow. So with that, at the end, what you're looking at is you're looking at all of these pieces. You're looking at the cost saving uh, up to 80 percent operational efficiency uh, and you know 10x more capacity because you could use this platform as a unified platform completely headless you know as well so you can you can use it end to end there and with that i think that's the that's the end uh, of of what i wanted to cover you know within this 20 25 minutes um, with this i will bring it back to sami sami do we have any questions from the audience and we can take probably two questions here Uh, thanks, Vikas. Uh, uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Maheshwari. Uh, is there an OCR integrated or we have any other technology to read information from images that is JPEG file attached embedded in the document? Sure. Thanks, Maheshwari, for the question. Uh, yes, I did not cover that. We do have an OCR which is built in. Uh, and what we've done is uh, we have kind of built an AI model on top of the OCR. So if you have a PDF document, whether it's native or non-native, which means an image, all of those extractions essentially happen natively within the platform. So you don't really have to, uh, you know, have any other OCR or any other thing done from your side. You can upload an image and the image gets, you know, the information gets extracted just the way you've seen with a normal PDF file. Any other questions, Sami? <clears throat> No, this was the only question, and now uh, we would uh, start for a panel discussion. Okay. okay. And uh, with us, we have uh, panel members, uh, Gokul Ganapati, uh, yeah, co-founder and CEO of botminds.ai. Sami, just give me one second, please. Uh, so to all the attendees, uh, thank you for the patience. Uh, we kind of did not offer that you could leave your questions uh, within the chat box. So may I please request anybody who has any questions, uh, please put them on the, on the general chat. You know, uh, Empire Media team will pick that up and uh, we will keep another five, seven minutes at the end to be able to answer that question. Uh, you could ask questions about what I covered and you could also ask the questions what we're going to cover and you can direct it to a panel member there. Uh, okay, back to you. Back to you, Sammy. Yes, because. Uh, uh... Uh, we have with us uh, Mohit Mehta, Director, SNP Global Market Intelligence, uh, Nikhil Asopa, a country head, Japan, Korea of Wipro Limited. And we have uh, Naveen Sharma, Associate Vice President, Senior Industry Principal Infosys. And we have uh, Krishnan Ramachandran, Senior Vice President, FNA and India CFO, Hinduja Global Solutions Limited. And we have uh, Gokul Ganapati, Co-founder and CEO of Botmind INC. So we'll start the panel discussion. Over to you, Vikas. 
Thank you. Uh, may I request the panel members to uh, turn the videos on so we can uh, we can start the conversation. All right, um, I'm going to do a video gallery. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you all the panel members for your time today uh, to be able to uh, join us for this conversation. Um, the first question that I would uh, essentially ask, uh, uh, and I'll take this to Mohit to begin with. Um, Mohit, um, what what obstacles do you see based on what you've heard so far and based on what you've done as part of the S&P Global? What, what are the obstacles that you have seen uh, you know, when it comes down to implementing an IPA or any kind of an automation solution? What challenges do organizations face? Right, uh, thanks, thanks, Rikas. And I think before, before getting into just um, a brief about uh, S&P and uh, S&P Global has been powering like markets of the future and um, market intelligence uh, is the financial services division of S&P and data means nothing without insights. And I think that's where we collect, analyze and interpret data from millions of hard to get sources, uh, how, how we get to the grand lines. Um, so our clients can- uh, um, make Sorry, Sammy, could you please put yourself on mute? And Parik Media, could you please put yourself on mute? Just a moment, mute, mute here, dear. Thank you. Sorry, my Go ahead. No way. So, so uh, basically, we we call what what I think you also refer to because that intelligent process automation as data transformation within an organization because. For us, data continues to be at the core and transformation makes them stronger. Uh, when, when we talk about the obstacles in implementation, I believe uh, for an organization like SNP, the technical debt and the decades of historical data that we have, along with complex workflows which are embedded inside those uh, pieces, makes it a difficult to start, but it's, it's more about how you move into those directions and you start uh, getting into that uh, that space. Um, I believe the next one is more on the lines of the change management, which we have to get it done, right? It's the subject matter expertise, whether our leaders are ready for that particular change management and what's the value that the overall um, process automation or data transformation brings to the table. So I believe these are a couple of pieces and I think because of the technical debt and the change management, the execution time is higher, which is definitely a big obstacle because with the, with the traditional and the technical debt and you are transforming the operations at the same time, it continues to manage both the pieces parallelly. So I believe these are some of the obstacles that um, many organizations face and uh, I think we have we have tried to come across a long way uh, when when we started or on on this particular journey. So uh, it's a it's an interesting uh, case study, I would say, to put it how you presented your case studies. Sure, thanks, Mohit. I think that's a that's a great point there. Um, there are there are different journeys that most of the organizations have, and I think it it depends upon what the starting point really is. Um, so I'll take this question now to Naveen. Uh, Naveen, you've got significant experience when it comes down to you know OCR, RPA, IDP, and now ID, uh, you know IPA. Um, so similar question, what I asked to Mohit, um, what are the challenges that an organization should kind of be aware of when you're rolling out an OCR plus AI model, and what are the possible avenues that an organization could kind of look at, uh, you know, to open up it? Usual challenges. Where do I start? And that's where process discovery tools that have just come about in about last year have, have come to a point. So in your, in your point of view, uh, you know, I'm just summarizing what I just said. In your point of view, what are the challenges that an organization faces uh, when it comes down to OCR, RPA, IPA, et cetera? Yeah, I think uh, Vikas, I, I would summarize the challenges that, and that's, this is from experience, is that they are all, they can all be clubbed into three categories. And that is people, process, and uh, technology. And starting in the reverse order, technology becomes the first challenge because not every organization is ready 
to do this kind of a niche skill or niche technology project itself if somebody is trying to build this kind of capability internally you need to be first aware of the kind of complexities involved you need to have the right set of people available it's not something you know a standard enterprise application development using dotnet or java this is this is different yeah. it's a different game right and you don't have this kind of skill set available in plenty in the market this is a still you know a, a niche skill area so you need to be aware of you know whether you want to go for a in house solution or you need to go and buy this from market market also is evolving you guys are one of the player i'm sure there are few more but uh, you know the kind of maturity that is there around it is what you need to keep in mind when you need to go for it second uh, from people perspective and that's assuming that you have already won over the technology challenges you have the solution the change management within the organization is the second hurdle imagine you have a set of people who have been habitual of doing the way doing the things the way they have been doing for years and you bring in something that was here is a genie that will work for you 10 times the speed the way you do it and probably more accurately or you know without a fear of human oversight or fatigue uh, related you know losing things and all that i mean what's their reaction becomes all the more important when for this thing to succeed the amount of training that is needed for the particular tool that you are bringing in the input has to come from that team it's a it's a tricky thing right you need them to help in building the solution more robust so that the solution actually can take over what they are doing today kind of scares them hmm. you need to make sure that you know people are excited about this solution and not scared this is going to augment their capability to do something more something better than what they are right. doing right. that's the people angle process angle also you know this going to basically change the whole dynamics of the way your operations around a process was designed because the timing of doing something the cost involved in that is going to come down drastically and you can basically you know go back to the drawing board and see that okay we had so many people we had such kind of timelines we had such kind of turnaround times and reviews and all all of that is going to change so you need to basically redesign your process also with such a thing this is a great power that comes to your hand so these things are i think the key factors if not handled they become challenges if handled well they become really the showcase studies hmm. absolutely absolutely i think you've kind of the people process technology is the first slide usually when you start digital transformation they put that heading there so there's definitely uh, you know that is there i'm going to go to nick very really quickly here um so nikhil i mean um Naveen talked about build versus buy. He didn't use the words, but essentially that was the point. Build versus buy. You want to build it, you buy it. In your view, how do you how do you measure from your view? You know, when you look at a bottom line efficiency, you look at uh, you know from the customers who are looking at certain um, you know success criteria. How do you look at significant benefits? How do you measure them? That okay, if this is the output that is coming through, that's a that's the success of my automation or a particular process. So thanks vikas because i think uh, uh, one of the major criteria where people go for this ip or any other process automation uh, technique they think cost benefit is the only objective and and i don't uh, uh, say no to it okay because that's the most important one but actually there are many other benefits so apart from process efficiency which we build in okay uh, there are other benefits as well okay let me let me give you some examples so any process automation which uh, a customer will buy okay or any organization would basically implement okay they have to see it whether it is reducing their errors okay you can understand and i think uh, uh, you or uh, somebody mentioned about the impact of these financial errors which happens okay what it costs millions and billions of dollars right okay any kind of a process automation should ensure that okay the error reduction happens now that is also true that a one size doesn't fit all and you will not be able to have a 100% zero error type of process because as you have mentioned as a part of your uh, platform as well it will keep learning and the ai will bring in and and you will keep learning and and get the solutions more robust okay mm -hmm. but at the end of the day it has to reduce the errors as much as possible so that's another success factor apart from the efficiency and the cost which which we all know about the third is the consistency 
Okay, that this the the automation process has to be consistent. It should not basically have inconsistency in nature. Otherwise, what will happen is you will see some success in a particular process, but you will not see in some other process. And hence, that consistency is very important. Okay, the next is. Uh, you talk about the compliance part of it, okay, the reliability of it, whether it is the, the process is reliable, okay, whether I can use this process across, okay, that is another. And the last but most important is the stakeholder management. See, let's understand, okay, the customer, and when I say stakeholders, means both internal and external stakeholders. The customer who has basically bought in your uh, platform or your solution, okay, for automation or process automation, okay, we have to make sure that particular problem of his gets resolved. Okay, you may have the best in class of the solution, but if it doesn't fit to that customer needs, okay, then it is not relevant to it. Similarly, for internal stakeholders, for employees who use it, it should not be that complicated, but it becomes so difficult to use that particular process. Okay, so it should be friendly in learning. It should be easy, ease of use. And the most important, as I said, it should directly impact the customer problem. Okay, if we are able to basically put up a scorecard on each of these parameters, okay, and then take it to the customer or the potential buyer, okay, then you will have a very good uh, mechanism of how this particular process or any particular process can work. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, thanks, Nico. Thank you very much for that. I think you've covered all of the pieces when it comes down to, you know, the and the fact that I like, you know, the fact you started with the fact that uh, cost benefit is not the only one. You kind of have to look at substantial pieces as well. Uh, you know, while working with Blue Prism, I kind of, uh, uh, you know, looked at certain scenarios where I kind of came, came aware of the fact that organizations and Aditya covered this at the very beginning, basically keep a fund for non-compliance. Banks keep right. a fund, a couple of million dollars worth of fund for non-compliance. And that is a clear use case for, you know, automation or AI automation instead of, being ready to pay, you can actually invest part of that. And then you have that fund kind of available to a large extent. Uh, so thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to go to Krishnan first, and then I'll come to Gokul, you know, with, with a follow-up question there. Uh, so Krishnan, um, you know, you, you, uh, uh, you know, look at it from a finance perspective. Uh, I'm just looking at it uh, on basis of what Nikhil has just mentioned, you know, what kind of, what kind of industry wide transformation initiatives can be taken what is the right time from a cfo hat uh, you know from a cfo perspective what are the right ways that you would recommend to say okay this is a good starting point i can approve that and this is kind of not so not so ready for transformation how how do you look at how do you look at this request and this position where a process kind of needs to be uh, taken through an automation journey what's your evaluation recommendation there as part of that organization thanks so basically, in my opinion, um, you know, uh, I think we should have uh, backed up on this journey um, uh, much earlier. I think uh, we have all uh, been waiting for the right time and right opportunity and trying to explore a lot of things. I guess the pandemic has also sort of pushed us uh, to take that leap forward, uh, which, which probably uh, could have been done a little earlier. Uh, but uh, we were all trying to, I mean, it's not that artificial intelligence has just come in. It's It's been there for quite a while. The way blockchain is also doing the rounds, but we are still waiting, you know, in terms of kickstarting somewhere to ensure that it's it, it, it then picks up its way. Uh, I'll, I'll break this into two parts. One is, you know, the client facing, the customer facing, and, and the other is internal uh, to look at it more from a CFO perspective. If you look at the uh, customer perspective, you know, we are all catering to customer needs. And today, when you put in a solution, you understand the customer processes because you would like to be a valued partner to the customer. And therefore, you undertake a process transformation journey to ensure that you service your customers better. And, and in line with that, you also want to engage in a meaningful process transformation and then apply intelligent automation. Uh, what is important to note is that uh, the customers, I mean, the clients are also moving up the value chain in the automation journey. So today, probably you're supporting some systems where the customer needs a lot of uh, help on the manual space. But when they automate, when they transform their process, then the processes that you have put in currently will also have to undergo a change. So as they say, the change is 
a permanent thing. Similarly, process transformation is a continuous thing. It's here to stay. So we have to be quite uh, conscious about uh, the changes that are happening around. And uh, this investment is a continuous investment. When you also undertake process uh, transformation uh, journey, it's quite important to bring um, experts, uh, technology experts into the game much ahead so that you know that a process that you uh, re-engineer or put in place is scalable in terms of automation rather than realizing this part a little later. So, so I think as an organization, from an industry perspective, these are the key things, especially when you engage into a discussion with your customers and try to uh, transform your back office processes. Now coming back to the CFO hat and, and doing your internal thing, I think gone are the days when you look at finance in isolation. It's all an integrated approach. Uh, every department, uh, the, the, the steps that they take, the process they put has an impact on the finance organization. And as you would be aware, the auditors also certify internal controls on financial reporting. And these internal controls not only govern the finance processes, but also all the departments, all the processes across the organization, uh, including all the support functions. So it's quite important that A, you create a strategic team within the organization to understand the organization needs and also be at a common you know, common platform from an understanding perspective. Once you have this core team, which constantly looks at the ripple effects of an action or a decision being implemented by one department that it has on the other department. And also the whole thing that will sort of, uh, uh, you know, you know bring, bring out as an end result. Um, and, and then you come up with a strategy and then decide which process stands in priority and prioritize your entire process and then undertake the transformation journey. Uh, I think uh, we also made a very important point that uh, off the shelf products should be leveraged rather than trying to do things internally because you may not have uh, sustainable uh, expertise on which you can rely from a, a long term. And uh, that's where uh, organization like that of yours come into play uh, to help customers uh, in deciding what is the right size, what is the right focus, how do we align, and then uh, do a transformation that can uh, be a long term uh, from a uh, from an automation perspective. So, so I think the CFO has to now or the CFO organization has to play a three sixty degree uh, uh, to 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 ensure that the transformation and automation are all hand in hand. And I think we are already there. Uh, we, we can't wait. There is, I mean, if there is any organization that is still waiting, I guess they are uh, behind, well behind. So uh, I, I, would, I would encourage all the organizations to sort of uh, uh, rather, uh, you know, go ahead with whatever their initiatives are, but uh, very clearly, uh, automation is clearly a, a priority. Thank you, Krishna. Um, you've brought in very good points. And I think we've all kind of seen multiple memes which say, which is your biggest digital transformation, you know, uh, initiator and COVID-19 sits right, right there at the top, uh, you know, amongst all the others. So yeah, very good point there. Um, and I think you, you bring in a good couple of things here uh, that I've kind of picked up is there's a build versus buy question. I'm coming to you, Gokul, with that question now. Um, and also you talked about the fact that whether you should look at components which are individual components or you should look at a unified component. And after Gokul Aditya, I'll come to you uh, with a question that uh, Krishan put out that there have to be teams that have to be kind of made internally. So you referred to Tom very early on. So we'll talk about that. But to Gokul, your question to you is, uh, what? how do you see uh, you know, variety of platforms put together versus a unified platform, build versus buy. And I think Mohit, you would also have some points there. So I'll allow Gokul to respond on that first. And after Aditya Mohit, I'll come back to you on it. Gokul. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks. So that's the right question to ask, uh, you know, uh, after we uh, heard from a, a CFO perspective. So uh, build versus buy and, um, you know, ROI is the key term, right? So 
how quickly you know how quickly i can see uh, the return on investment and also how big a return on investment i can expect so that's uh, you know what i uh, i like to emphasize and that's what i'm you know i'm uh, i'm in, uh, forced to engage in a discussion with my customers again and again so that's closely tied to the unified nature of uh, the you know unified nature of the solution or platform uh, you need now for example automation in by nature you, you know as a financial services back office you have many process you know in one process you have to deal with uh, earning call transcript in another process another process you have to deal with uh, like uh, you know uh, 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 credit agreement in another process you have to deal with uh, uh, an email just email content uh, you know and uh, uh, presentation investment presentation so it's different document types different sources and you may uh, may have you know in enterprise multiple teams working on it and you know if you, you know if you want to automate each and every process as a piece mail and piece mail then it is you know huge investment both on time as well as cost right that's where you know you need a you know unified platform and a, a single platform which can help you in uh, creating uh, solutions and in in short time and then uh, platform is okay but what what's the purpose if you have a platform that needs you know many uh, months to give you the solution so you can use uh, you know platform like bot finds where with that comes with a pre trained model you know a lot of components readily available you know using which you can create solutions that's uh, uh, that's the you know uh, build versus buy uh, um, uh, you know uh, answer to the build versus uh, versus buy question and also i know i like to add a point because you know a uh, lot of talk about the the change management people and and I, for that also i like to pick one word from you know uh, mr krishnan there going up the value chain right uh, it's important not only from organization standpoint and also from the subject matter experts uh, standpoint if you see financial services back office why its nature it's a uh, sme heavy uh, document uh, heavy or information intensive and you know it it's it's a research i mean you are basically dealing with research analyst and if in in case if you know a research analyst is doing a data entry you know that's huge uh, you know loss i know uh, cap, I mean, resource capital i mean capital loss and also they should not spend time in you know searching for the information because you know the searching for information is a non standard process it's a huge subjective you know process again and again when i talk to uh my customers they'll say it's a subjective subject if you if you deep dive the subjective nature or the non standard nature comes in searching for the information any any research analyst you give the data they will take a right decision is good or bad the problem comes in this or that no that's where ai can help no in a in a long i mean as vikas okay in a 22 page uh, call transcript we can give you you know this is these are the two three instances where you know change in operations you know mention but the research analyst now can uh, do the quick uh, decision okay this is the you know this will be the impact on the, uh, the revenue uh, for the company in the next quarter they can take a decision that's very well standardized they have uh, you know uh, they have the clarity but if you allow i mean if you ask them to go and search for the information in in a document or just by giving the source that's where you know uh, 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 subjectivity or you know non standard nature comes into picture so those are the areas you know uh, uh, ai can help bot finds can help and uh, uh, that's uh, a good way to push our research analyst to you uh, know uh, in the to the higher value uh, plane and that also you know translates the value to our customers as well awesome thanks Thank rohul um aditya coming to you with the with the point that uh, krishan mentioned and uh, gokul also highlighted there um there needs to be and i think uh, navin also mentioned that very you know very early on there needs to be specific team to either do change management or to basically implement rpa and most of the rpa vendors uh, basically have that as a target operating model some call it as a robotic operating model uh, what's the tom in your view from a change management perspective any organization that is heading towards an ai implementation uh, what does it look like uh, what could it look like uh, your recommendation there please yeah so 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 we so you know uh, you know when i was working with accenture you know we would we were doing this automation you know for for a large multinational company and stuff like that so you know one of the big things we were we saw and i had mentioned this earlier 
was that uh, you know uh, they had dis disparate systems right i mean the systems were different the way they were working was very very different right and when we when we wanted to implement this automation i mean we did not find significant benefits because of the various systems it was not unified and you know there was various systems right i mean so one of the things we said that if you want to really have the bang for the buck one of the critical um, things you need to first do is standardize your systems, right? You standardize the system across what you do in Europe, what you do in APAC, what you do in Americas. First, you need to standardize those systems and then you put the automation layer on top of it. Then you put the AI layer on. And that's where you see the maximum benefit, right? I mean, we could see a benefit of almost 80, 90%. So I think that's key. The other thing is that if you have disparate systems and not, uh, not unified systems, you know, the, how the data flows, how do you analyze the data and those kind of things also takes a big impact because you need to have different different um, you know uh, data extracting machines you know you need to have different different way you analyze the data when you have different different systems right so it's very important to have a unified you know system so you know you your time to serve the customer the cost to serve the customer and actually the the quality of service you provide is significantly better also and and also the data you get is is a standard data format, right? I mean, in terms of, you know, you don't have to go to various systems to gather data. It's just there and you analyze the data and you know, boom, you can make an impact, um, you know, from a customer standpoint. The other thing is that, you know, once you do an RPA, right? I mean, you need to change the TOM, which is you know, the, the model pre and post needs to be different where you see the real value where automation is acting, right? So where is the human interaction or touch, if any, uh, you know, during this whole process, this is going to be the beginning or the end where there's a QC and stuff like that. And if there's multiple touch points, right? I mean, uh, there might uh, not be uh, the benefit which you want to realize, uh, you know, from an automation standpoint. So, so you need to have a clear, you know, strategy in terms of what's the term going to be post that. And a lot of companies struggle with this, right? And there's an important aspect of how do you want to do your target operating model eventually, right? To get the maximum benefit impact on that. So that's my two bits on this. Right. Thanks, Arupya. Uh, thanks for that. I think uh, importance of Tom, importance of creating a specific team. And there's a misconception within the, I wouldn't say industry, but let me just say that for lack of a better word, is that just buying a technology actually gets you results, which is never a case. You need to get the technology, you need to have the right people and Krishna pointed out that you, you better have people who know what to do about it rather than trying to do internally by, by yourself. So that's a recommendation. And Mohit, I'm coming to you with this question now. Um, so your spirit automation for many processes, you see multiple different types of documents, you know, sources, inputs coming through. Uh, you know, everybody, you know, Krishna, Aditya, Gokul, Naveen also pointed that out. Nikhil also mentioned that multiple systems could be a challenge. So in the RPG IP journey that you have seen so far, how do you see a unified platform playing against um, multiple combination of system, either whether they are homegrown or put together? Uh, you are basically in the middle of that, all of those pieces. So what's, what's your recommendation for the audience here? Right, uh, no, I think that's, a, that's an interesting place to be in uh, sometimes, but um, so how, how we are looking at uh, some of these aspects in our organization is on the lines that make each of the service as a microservice. And then the bigger question comes in that, what do you want to build or what do you want to buy? And like when I started the earlier discussion, the technical debt and the complex workflow along with the tons of historical data, our first preference usually comes towards a building a model, but with the, with the limited technical resources, skill sets, sometimes that sails through, sometimes it has to move towards a buy model also. So I'll, I'll give you an example on that. When, when we look for a solution, we do not look for a solution only for then our organization. We look at it in a more holistic point of view. So taking an example, like Kensho is the this center of innovation for, uh, it's an, a company that uh, SNP acquired a couple of years ago. And now we had the similar problem of call transcribing, right? Like what you also talked about as a case study. Now we had the similar situation on where to move forward towards and we reached our internal stakeholders. Now we have created a product which is Kensho Scribe, which does exactly the same thing on the call transcript. So it does 
a lot of that work and that's a uh, that's a good example of a build model whereas i cannot marry my entire each of the microservice to only one technology because divorces are difficult right like you have to either cut those uh, knots and that's where the real challenges are so that's where we are progressing in the lines of build each microservice have a solution for those microservices where the data can sit in the dmss and it talks directly so that unified part which aditya mentioned i think that is where the the data sits and that data uh, is curated but do i need only one unified platform i think we tried we burnt our hands and we are definitely moving in a direction that microservices are much stronger because then you are not marrying to one piece for your entire organization and you have multiple facets that you can uh, leverage value from so that that's what my take would be that uh, on uh, this particular piece uh, vikas got it got it i think thanks thanks for that uh, you know gokul kind of and i kind of you know uh, mention from a very bot minds perspective but thanks for your perspective because that's kind of uh, you know important to understand what you know what things looks like when you're looking at evaluation uh so navin i'm going to come to you with that um so from the unified platform itself uh there are of course a lot of verticals horizontals infosys broken down every single organization is is managed that way um you know mohit says that um uh, and that's true um uh, and i want your reaction on that is that one platform and of course it's a uh, putting all your you know eggs in one basket scenario if you have just one platform doing everything you're basically are not thinking straight to a large extent although i am proposing that you have one platform but at the same time uh criticality of having a platform that can do more than just one thing like finance then you having to invest in multiple platforms because what you bought kind of only could do this and could not do something else so the value that a horizontal platform brings in like ours what's your view based on what you have seen and uh, you know we kind of 10 minutes into the closure so i'm going to bring this question to everybody uh, just 30 second quick reaction starting with you naveen on the importance of a platform that is kind of more horizontal in nature what's your view quickly on that i think uh, absolutely this makes sense there's there's two part always to any platform the technology part and the domain expertise that it brings in so you know while in an evolving stage this is more technology heavy but obviously as the platform matures it is going to build up its own repository of you know important information and its ai it's like a kid that is learning as things mature as things evolve you are going to have uh, you know a library of things or library of models which are process specific so you may probably start with finance related use cases and with every learning you know your your platform is going to become richer and what applies for finance tomorrow today can can grow and be used as basis for something in legal can also be used in case of hr maybe you know something related to compliance and uh, you know there's no end to it so while it may start with something which is very uh, process centric may sound like a, a you know a niche or a vertical thing but i think it has its natural evolution in the form of a horizontal service that's definitely a future it's it's can't, it can't be contained in one because at the end of the day it's a people's game right you are actually to the solution replacing or rather augmenting people's skill domain part is is uh, you know one angle to it but at the end of the day everybody uses technology for augmenting their current capability right so okay. and analytics these are these are general skills like right? intelligent interpretation of what is written it's a general skill it equally applies for somebody coming in either from a finance domain coming in from legal coming in from hr coming in from various uh, various domains so i think horizontal is the way that it will evolve even if it may start with a, a particular domain got it thanks thanks for that point of view nikhil i'm going to come to you with the same question uh the question is you know your experience of course is uh you know running operations and you're looking at multiple geographies um your your quick reaction on horizontal platform versus versus individual pieces of component uh you know that are that are specialized to a vertical so because it is something which the organization who is planning to buy and who wants to implement this platform has to decide okay mm-hmm. because it cannot be one answer okay there may be an organization where 
for example, an organization may have the biggest requirement or the biggest challenges they are facing on the finance side and they may go to a platform which is heavier on the finance side and may, may ignore the other part of the, of the organization. Okay. At the same time, if they say, no, we would like to have a very consistent across all the different departments of my organization and they may go with the horizontal one. So, so it's a trade-off which organizations have to do it and purely depends on what their pain point is. As I was mentioning in my initial remark as well, Okay, unless and until a platform marries to the stakeholders pain point. Okay, right. the platform is not the, the right choice of a platform. It may be the best platform in the world. Okay, but it may not be the best for that particular organization. So the right. organization has to decide where I bleed the most, where I have the biggest pain point, And based on that, they have to decide. So that, that would be my two cents. On that. Thanks. Thanks, Nikhil. And I'm looking at different point of views here so the audience can get all the flavors. So Krishnan, right. I'm coming right. to you with the same question. In your view, how do you look at a unified platform versus a combination of a couple of platforms? So in my opinion, both coexist. Uh, uh, so, so, so the way I would look at it is, see, you have horizontal platforms to cater to the specific requirement, but any of these platform to function from an organization standpoint has to have a common thread. So let me give you an example. If you look at the finance domain, today you want to create, let's say, an expense management system, right? Or you want to look at procurement from, uh, you know, creating a procurement management system. But you will agree that all of this needs an approval hierarchy. And this approval hierarchy has to move from your uh, human resource management system, an HRMS. Because that is where the employee data resides in the employee hierarchy, the approval hierarchy. And, and that's a continuous thing. I mean, in a company like that of ours, where we have close to 37,500 employees across globe. Hmm. And in India, we have close to about 13,500 employees with an attrition, a heavy attrition rate. The data keeps changing and these moving parts have to sink in, right? So what we have done, for example, is to build one data source. So what happens is you build one source, which will be a feeder as well as a taker. And then the data is constantly um, updated with the latest changes. So I think a horizontal platform is definitely needed because you need that to be the specialization in that particular domain. But you also need all that information. And if you really need to scale up, you could decide how to automate in a unified platform and send it back to the respective horizontal platform. So in my view, both are important, but the intelligence lies in how easily you integrate all of this together and then build in a layer which can really uh, help in augmenting the performance of all of these independent systems along with reaping the benefits of a unified system. Absolutely. Thank you, Krishn. Uh, Gokul, at last, uh, coming to you on that, uh, your comments and all the viewpoints that you've heard, anything from your side that you want to add? It's interesting viewpoints uh, uh, all over the spectrum. Uh, that's the same kind of uh, you know views I'm also uh, hearing in, in the market when I'm going talking to the people. Uh, more uh, importantly, what I want to convey here is, um, I mean, coming back to the financial services itself, financial services back office, you know, creating a, a model that understands transcripts and also creating another model that understands, let's say, 10K filings. And at the same time, there's another team working on, you know, um, let's say monitoring press releases. Or web, uh, I have to monitor, let's say, uh, yeah, a fund house, all their investments. Okay. So you have you know, different teams, different documents. And, you know, yes, you can go for a solution that does, you know, great work on, uh, you know, uh, ten uh, abstracting 10K filings. Yes. At, at the same time, you, you are given a choice. In, here is a horizontal platform. You can create that vertical, I mean, focused solutions to the same level of accuracy or even better accuracy. And that too in, you know, days or weeks. And that's, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no brainer addition and uh, you know that's what we are uh, pushing to um, uh, our customers maybe I'm, I'm so aggressive here because the the kind of response i'm uh, now uh, hearing uh, from our early adapters is something like okay there is one version platform 
train our subject matter experts they can you know uh, create the solution uh, in the way in the shape in the form they want and then that too in uh, you know days to weeks and and matches the accuracies and uh, you know efficiencies the other uh, you know um, uh, what to say uh, single use case solution provides and that's uh, you know that's what i will uh, you know uh, suggest and i will i will recommend uh, to the audience here you know uh, try horizontal platform and uh, you will see the way thank you perfect pitch coco thank you for that um <laughs> I'm just going to go on to the uh, chat window and pick up a couple of questions there. Uh, so we had Maheshwari's question, Maheshwar's question, so that is addressed. Uh, Barzad Wadia, you had a question. Uh, are you still here? Would you like to ask the question in person? Uh, you can turn on your audio and speak about that. Yeah, I just wanted to know uh, regarding the language capabilities. I thought you had touched upon that, and uh, you know, uh, we we didn't uh, discuss on that. So, what about the language capabilities in terms of extraction? Is it only English, or do you have uh, you know other languages as well? Sure. Thanks, Rajat, for the question. Uh, at the moment, we have only English. We have kind of loaded up uh, the semantic understanding of the particular language. But picking up a new language, we are working with a couple of our other clients as well. That is a matter of about three to four weeks. Gopal, do you want to add? something technically there in terms of languages yeah yeah sure so the speed of execution right the, the how quickly you can see the results is because of the free train models the the core models we have and the, it's trained heavily with the english language documents and english language um, um, uh, you know documents and um, you know we can uh, transfer few of the learnings and abstract understanding from one language to other but that needs uh, you know few weeks thank you okay. Lalit, you had a question. Are you still here? Would you like to ask your question? Okay. Uh, so Lalit's question was, what all OCRs are available? Um, Google, Microsoft, or any other vendor. So we use Google Tesseract as the inbuilt OCR, uh, but we are absolutely flexible. Um, our Google OCR does the initial part. Then we have AI models built on top of that to do additional things that we'd like to do. But at the same time, if an organization is looking at, you know, Abbey or something else, ours is a modular approach. We can, of course, interact with that and, you know, put Abbey instead of Google and, you know, take it forward from uh, that point onwards. Uh, because I'd like to add a point here. So yes, please. We assume people understand Google, I mean, test track, even though it's from Google, it's open source. We are not using any, you know, Google vision OCR and all. It's a open source test track as a foundational block for our own OCR. So that's a uh, key difference. Thanks, Google. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, Jaya Prakash, are you still here? Would you like to ask your question? Okay, I will ask that. Yeah, yeah. Jaya, all right, please. Please go ahead. Uh, Jaya, you're back on mute. Would you like to ask your question? Okay, I'll I'll take that up for you. Uh, how do you justify legal and regulatory compliance? Uh, this is something that I had covered uh, as part of our uh, enterprise ready platform. So we are a SaaS based platform. Uh, our, unlike any other AI SaaS based platform where you have initial capture and then you have a mothership AI sitting somewhere with the, with the product, with the company, where all the decisions essentially get done. For us, the AI that we have developed literally sits in your platform. So a document kind of never leaves uh, your private cloud. So everything literally sits there. And that cloud is within the jurisdiction, geography, wherever you have that you know, deployed. So the cloud sits there. So from a compliance and like regulatory perspective, it has kind of never left your premises anyway. We at BotMinds never need to see your data, even for training or for you know, uh, actual execution. All of that can be done directly by you on a point and click training. All right. So Lalit had one more question here. Do we have any matrix to measure the efficiency of an ROI uh, of, of having AI bot? So if I translate that, the question really is, do we, is there a way in which we can measure the uh, efficiency of an of an uh, a, of ROI for that? I think there are a couple of points. Nikhil mentioned that, uh, Naveen mentioned, uh, almost everybody mentioned that is that, you know, the cost basically is not your main ROI. You're looking at accuracy as the point that is coming through. Of course, there are information from the platform, reports which are available from the platform in terms of the time that is spent. Something that I haven't spoken about is the transparent AI. 
Uh, and that's where a lot of conversation about the bias exists on what AI is trained on. So a transparent AI from bot minds essentially allows you to see why is it giving the accurate results of 90%, whereas the other attribute is at still 65, 70%. So you can literally see on what basis, uh, how many examples did it pick up, uh, how many examples need to be given so that you can push up the accuracy level there. So that's the piece that we look at. Um, Joydeep has asked a, a question here. Uh, when you say build versus buy, my understanding is, uh, sorry, Joydeep, do you want to ask your question? Are you still here? Uh, if I can read out for Joy DB, he's talking about why it has, why has it taken so long for AI technology to gain traction? Yeah. Uh, maybe I can okay. take that question if you allow, because so yeah. uh, more sure. more specifically, I'll answer from uh, the NLP angle, right? Because uh, we call uh, the 2020 is a year of NLP, where uh, 2019, 2018 is a year of computers and all those stuff. So a lot of breakthroughs research literally happening in the last one year or you know six months whatever research breakthroughs achieved in 2019 you know double the triple happened in 2020 and now it's it's happening you know even a much faster uh, uh, clip so uh, the kind of use cases uh, solved by uh, the ai is you know getting matured it's getting closer to the real world and that's the uh, uh, you know reason for the re, uh, you know, recent uh, traction. And um, that's, it's not so long, okay, when compared to, uh, when, when compared to the journey it takes computer science to the computer apps, you know, the data science to data apps, it took, you know, less time. So it's not too long, but yes, I, I understand the- Thanks, so cool. And I think there is a lot of, uh, if I could just add there, uh, there's a lot of pieces that happened when we did big data, you know, 10 years, 15 years ago, where we were just collecting all sort of data. And AI basically thrives on data. Right now, what we have is we've got social media, we've got text, we've got you know, video, we've got audio, all of these pieces are coming through, which 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago was a, was a study on its own in terms of being able to generate that data. So just to add on Gokul's point, that's, that's basically what has changed. And last year, like everybody said, you know, COVID-19, thanks to that, a lot of transformation kind of happened, you know, there. Um, with that, if there are no more questions, we have five minutes over. I would like to thank all the panel members for their time today, for their contribution, for answering the questions, and, uh, and, and being able to share your experience with, with us at BotMinds and with everybody who has kind of joined here. And also a big thank you to all the participants who joined and stayed on for another five, six minutes. Uh, thank you very much and wish you a, a good weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much.